Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, Frank, Julie, Joey and Susie. Known collectively as the Legion. God, this killer has been so extensively requested for such a long time, it's a miracle I haven't covered them yet. But there's been a very good reason for it. I knew an update to their power was coming and I really didn't want to have to play them for footage as they were before. We had to wait a good long while for it, but the Legion update has proved immensely popular. While Legion still isn't really my cup of tea, I'm glad they're a bit less, um... Every morning I break my legs, and every afternoon I break my arms. And a bit more... One thing I'm really glad this rework preserved was the Legion's mechanic identity. When any update to a character comes, the first priority should always be that the character remains appealing to as much of the original player base as possible. If you remove what made the original appealing to put in something else, you're not updating anything. You're deleting something people loved and replacing it with something completely different that's wearing its skin. I call this getting freddied. And I'm extremely glad Legion didn't get freddied when they got updated. Not only does it mean Legion players get to keep enjoying their favourite killer, it brings me hope that the twins won't get freddied since their update is next on the docket. But there's more than one way to update a character. As much as a rework can change the way a character is played, a lore update like a tome story can change how a character is understood. Sometimes a change can be for the best, but other times it can feel alienating like the character you've grown to care about has been scraped away without any care for what compelled you to like them in the first place. What happens when the story behind your characters gets Freddy? When the Legion got their tome story in Tome 3, a lot of people claimed that they had been Freddy. It's been suggested that the tome story Soldiers of Mayhem has destroyed what made the Legion's group appealing, and features retcons to their base lore that cheapen them and their relationships with each other. I'd like to jump in here and discuss whether that's entirely true, and in doing so discuss the impact of fanon and fan interpretations of characters on their popularity and public perception. Today, we're going to make the Legion make sense. In order to properly understand what relationships Soldiers of Mayhem may or may not have wrecked, we've got to start at the beginning, with the base law that first established those relationships. The Legion's base law primarily follows the life and times of Frank Morrison, the leader of the gang of teenagers who terrorised Ormond that would eventually become known as the Legion. Frank is given a pretty miserable childhood, a troublemaking young man bounced from foster home to foster home from the age of six, never able to settle down anywhere. Right away, I love this introduction. It's a very normal start to Frank's story that doesn't condemn him as some heartless monster, while also not turning him into some well-meaning saint. It's a healthy middle ground that not a lot of killer backstories even today manage to strike. And it's very relevant given the time period that he comes from. Judging by technology, music and fashion that the Legion show off at every single opportunity, the gang got together at probably some point in the late 90s, when Frank was 19, meaning he and the rest of the Legion were probably born in the early 1980s. The early 80s marked the highest divorce rates in the 20th century, after divorce laws became more permissive in the 1970s, but before the boom in available contraception and later life marriage in the 90s. This sudden burst of unhappy marriages ending in divorce meant a lot of children ended up in care, with a social safety net that neither had the resources nor the information to cope with the surge. And Frank's story is a pretty typical one for kids at the time. It's not really dwelled on, but it's a really good way for the story to ground itself in real life history to make it a bit more authentic and believable without being distracting. When he was 16, Frank would go to his last foster home in the sleepy mountain town of Ormond, Alberta. His foster dad didn't really want a lot to do with him, so Frank was mostly left to his own devices. In a dreary little town of 6,000 people, there wasn't exactly a ton to do, and Frank quickly got to know a few of the local youngsters. He met Julie Kostenko, Susie Lavoie, and Joey, we don't know his last name, and the group soon to be known as the Legion was formed. While this story is unquestionably centred around Frank, we do get a reason for each individual Legion member to sign on with him. Julie sees Frank as her ticket out of Ormond into a more exciting life. Joey wants to make an impression on the people around him by showing off, and Susie just seems to be a uh, hanger-on, who doesn't have enough confidence to strike out on her own. Julie will go on to get a more in-depth tone story later down the line, but for now this is all we really get. A few words to characterise each of them when we first meet them. 
I do appreciate that these characterizations remain consistent in the only other moment in the story that a character other than Frank gets to make a decision. The death of the cleaner. Joey is dared by Frank to vandalize the video store and his car is used to transport the body, indicating that he's a people pleaser who tries hard to impress Frank, show his mettle and remain useful to stay on his good side. Julie only stabs the cleaner when Frank and Joey have already done so, and while she does willingly stab him, she does so with her eyes closed, affirming that she wants to kind of avoid responsibility for her actions and is okay with the plausible deniability of following the crowd. And Susie doesn't want to kill the cleaner at all, and Frank has to physically force her to do it, suggesting that she lacks the confidence to do what the others do. All of these traits are completely consistent with what we already know about the characters, even from their meagre descriptions letting readers attach themselves to their favourite. But there's one missing piece of the puzzle, an absence that I really felt upon rereading this story that I think can't go unsaid. While we get a good sense of how each of these characters are individually, we don't get an understanding of their relationships with each other. We're told they're meant to be this bedevil-may-care band of brigands making merry across Ormond, but it's hard to get that sense of camaraderie down when we don't know how any of them interact with each other. Frank and Julie are maybe the only exception, as the story implies a romantic connection between Frank and Julie that's confirmed in the comment descriptions. But Joey and Susie are pretty much planks of wood with a single personality trait scrawled on with felt tip, and their relationship with the rest of the crew basically don't exist. It's an absence you can really feel when you compare it to the only other multi-person killer in the game, the twins, where you get a sense of Charlotte and Victor's respective personalities and their relationship with each other at the same time. A big reason I think the Legion's relationships with each other fall on their face in the base story is because so much of the focus is put on Frank. If you like Frank individually, I'm sure the story is a lot more rewarding for you, but I can't really confidently say myself because I find Frank to easily be the least interesting of the Legion members. Hey, yo, what did you just say? Did you just say something rude about Frank from the Legion within the video game of Dead by Daylight? Holy fuck! Is that a disembodied voice? hate those. And I bet this one's going to go on about some disagreement or alternative perspective it has on the character base its experiences and enjoyment of them. Like, duh. Uh, how'd you know exactly? Are you some kind of script writer? Yeah, it's almost like this bit is shaping up to be like a segue or something, like a natural transition between the parts of the video which I was in and the part that this unknown voice of a streamer that may or may not have a link in the description is in that would make the transition smooth and not jarring to have to deal with as a viewer. So should I just get on with it then? Yes, please, I'm running out of material. Sure thing. Cheers, mate. Hey, I'm Tat, also known as Deteriu, and I'm a Dead by Daylight streamer and content creator. I'm most known for my dedication and gameplay surrounding the Legion. Out of all the Legion members, I have to say I enjoy Frank the most. Susie's outfits are cool and all, but as far as gameplay and lore is concerned, Frank is dank and simply the goat, and you're not convincing me otherwise. It's the big reason why I'm not too bothered that he's the main attraction of their story, because I believe he encapsulates the Legion's whole identity. Take a look at the original story of the Legion. Frank attacked the cleaner out of pure instinct, potentially rage if you would. He of course heard Julie cry out, and that would send any man into a frenzy. Sorry, I kinda had to slip one in at some point. Anyway, the moment of rage that you see in their story is translated almost seamlessly into the actual gameplay. You enter frenzy and you sort of lose sight of the things around you. You're focused on a target, hence the removal of scratch marks and blood pools in the power. Oh, but wait, there's so much more. You know how when people get so mad they become enraged, they see red? Well, during Feral Frenzy, Killer Instinct is bright red and your screen pulsates with red. Almost like your blood vessels in your eyes are about to burst. Uh, one important thing to remember by the way, the Killer Instinct mechanic, even though like every killer seems to have it now, was originally exclusive to the Legion. Like, this was- this isn't a reach because it's a mechanic that was literally made for them. Like, if any killer is allowed to have a law accurate reason why Killer Instinct is the way it is, it's Legion. So, yeah, just thought I'd remind you of that. Carry on. Every time you hit a survivor in Feral Frenzy, you get faster, more dangerous, and that pulsing red effect grows stronger. What happens at the end of Frenzy? 
Legion gets so mad, so full of rage, that they change the rules of their own power. Rather than being non-lethal, Frenzy begins downing survivors, and I think this perfectly mimics the original moment where Frank charges down a cleaner with nothing but a knife. There's also an important character trait about Frank that I think gets overlooked. One thing we're constantly getting told about him is that he's charismatic, the kind of guy who could light up a whole room and inspire people into action. It makes sense that someone like that would become the leader of the Legion. They're not ideologues fighting for a cause who need a planner or a practical figure to lead them. They're teenagers looking for a good time, and Frank's the guy who looks like he can offer that. It's why he's central to the marketing material for the chapter. He's selling the Dead by Daylight community on a life of vandalism and violence, just like he sold the others on it. He's not a planner with a long-term goal, he's just here for a good time. And I think that's part of what makes Legion as a killer so compelling. It's very easy to take this game a bit too seriously, especially when you're playing as killer. But sometimes you just gotta take it easy run and stab some people while listening to some absolute bangers. And that is why I believe Frank is not only the best Legion member, but how the gameplay and the lore intertwine in an underappreciated way. Thanks for all that, Tat. Very cool. For real? Anybody who likes the funny run and stab Canadian teenagers either knows who Tataru is by now or frankly should do. And if you didn't before, now you've got no excuse not to check him out using the link to his Twitch I popped in the description. And his insights here have been invaluable. We now have a really strong idea of the Legion as individuals, and especially Frank as of their base lore. Now we've got that, let's look at the tome and discuss how that perception of the Legion may have changed in a way that frustrated some people. First thing to notice, this tome is not about Frank. I mean, he's in it, but he doesn't have the spotlight that he does in the base lore. The Tome Story Soldiers of Mayhem covers the life of Judy Kostenko, Frank's girlfriend and my personal favourite Legion member. The story is set during the very early days of the Legion's existence as a group. The first entry is the first meeting between Frank and Julia at a diner in Ormond. It's kind of a meet-cute for Ormond's newest power couple, as we get Judy's first impressions of Frank while she sketches him waiting for a coffee. I love that the first thing Judy notices about Frank is that he's quite clearly not from Ormond. It showcases something about Julie that becomes more and more clear the further the story goes. How she views and understands the people around her, especially Frank. If I could use a single word to describe Julie, it's opportunistic. And if the base lord loosely implied this, Soldiers of Mayhem all but states it outright. I'm not going to go on record saying Frank and Julie's relationship isn't born out of genuine affection and love on some level because I don't think that's entirely fair. But I think it is fair to say that Frank serves a practical purpose to Julie beyond that. And that's something that Julie sees very clearly from day one. The first thing she notices is that he's fun, free, rebellious, and once again not from Ormond. Something that's pretty innocuous until you realise that their base law said Julie saw him as her ticket out of Ormond. Within seconds of first meeting him, Julie's already noticed what she wants from Frank and has invited him to her party, assured that her friends are going to love him. Look at the language here. While she clearly enjoys his company, Something at the forefront of her mind is how he'll come across to her friends, and how much better he is going to make her social life. Julie knows she stands to benefit from Frank being around. And that's something that we get to see developed as Frank attends the party and him and Julie get to know each other a little bit better. And we learn about Julie too. She's got a scrapbook of serial killers which has massive Ted Bundy roleplayer TikTok energy, and has exhaustive knowledge of slasher movies. I'm a big fan of this little detail because it's a reminder that the Legion were based in many ways on another late 90s multi-person teenage killer in a white mask who also loved scary movies, Ghostface. As Julie and Frank become more involved in each other's lives, something about Julie and her relationship with Frank becomes increasingly clear. Despite Frank being ostensibly the leader of the group, Julie seems to come up with a lot of the ideas as to what the group should actually do, from dares and challenges with Frank to the group's name itself. Frank has a lot of ideas too, but they're generally a lot less practical than Julie's. He spouts off his insane theories about manifesting what you want in the world in a big global conspiracy to keep the sheeple in their place, but nobody, especially Julie, really takes him that seriously. Julie notices that Frank is argumentative and likes to make these grand statements that don't really mean anything simply because they sound good to him. 
Julie shares Frank's thirst for action and conflict and freedom, and where the romantic chemistry comes from. But undercutting that for Julie is a practicality that Frank kind of lacks. Julie suggests the two of them compete to see how many car emblems they can steal from each other. But she also gives Frank a ski mask to do so anonymously without risk of being caught, something Frank may not have had initiative to do on his own. Not that he's stupid, but he doesn't really seem to care that much about the consequences of his actions, at least not as much as Julie does. And that's what I find so interesting about her. She has Frank's drive for rebellion with an understanding of the consequences of that rebellion and active desire to avoid dealing with those consequences. She likes to work on little creative projects of her own, such as her doodles and the snow globes, but even those seem driven by a combination of the same boredom and ambition that drove her to rebel in the first place. She's bored of having to conform to Ormond's humdrum life and has ambitions to effectively rule the town answer to nobody. Ambitions that Frank shares and is key to helping her achieve. As a result, their relationship is incredibly interesting, and it brings to mind a literary character many centuries old that a great many of you may probably have heard of, but not really learn much about. Lady Macbeth is the wife of the titular Macbeth in Shakespeare's play of the same name, and she's almost as important a character as Macbeth himself. For those who don't know, the play is about Macbeth taking over Scotland by murdering the ruling King Duncan in his sleep, an act which leads to his slow descent into madness after being racked by guilt. Despite becoming a bloodthirsty tyrant by the end, Macbeth isn't originally planning on regicide at the start of the play, only spurred into it by the encouragement of his wife. Lady Macbeth is a central character in most of the story, constantly driving her husband's ambitions further and further to the point that she almost kills King Duncan herself. Much like Macbeth, ambition and the promise of something greater than mundanity is what drives Frank to take the Legion's activities further and further, and much like Lady Macbeth, Julie is the voice of that ambition, egging him on and ensuring he doesn't falter. The relationships are mutually loving, even regardless of that ambition, but that doesn't make the dynamic of the female manipulator and the man of action any less relevant. The big difference, however, is what happens once they get what they want. In Macbeth, the new king and queen are ridden with trouble stemming from guilt after the murder of King Duncan. Lady Macbeth starts compulsively scrubbing herself to try and wash the guilt out and ends up killing herself and Macbeth himself descends into mania and paranoia until he's eventually usurped in turn by Macduff. That same guilt is not present in the Soldiers of Mayhem story, as Julie and Frank drive each other to keep going instead of look back at the damage they've done as anything other than a good time. This makes Julie's role in the power dynamic of the Legion very interesting, because Frank might lead the group, but Joey and Susie are ultimately Julie's friends. He'd be nothing without her, and if she wanted to strike out on her own with Joey and Susie, she absolutely could but she doesn't bother. She doesn't get her hands as dirty as Frank does, or drive the others to the same acts of vandalism as him, but that's not because she's better than him or feels any guilt about it. It's simply because it's easier that way. It's what I said before about Julie seeing Frank in part as a tool to help her achieve her ambitions. These are ambitions that she could achieve by herself, but letting Frank help her do it helps her evade responsibility for her own actions. It's why she waits for Frank and Jerry to have the cleaner while taking her turn. She will never be the first one to shed blood or step out of line because if she's not, she can claim to herself or others that she's just following along. And she's been led along this path of wrongdoing by Frank instead of accepting the fact that she doesn't want to care about the consequences of her actions. Frank is in charge of the Legion only because Julie allows him to be, because it's easier for her to be totally carefree and that responsibility when she can tell herself it's not her job to care. And it makes her probably the most moderate principle female killer, at least before we look at licensed killers. We talked a lot about women's rights, but Soldiers of Mayhem supports women's wrongs too, and is the power behind the throne of all the most notorious gang of teenage hooligans, Julie is a woman with a lot of wrongs. And speaking of wrongs, this is where we start to have a canonicity problem in terms of the base law being compatible with the tome, or at least the cinematic that came with it. The Legion's law ends with Frank cajoling the rest of them into attacking Joey's former place of work that just fired him, with the implication that this is the place where the Legion ran into the cleaner, and took their first life together in their base law. And in their base law, the cleaner grabs Julie and is immediately attacked by Frank, followed by Joey, Julie and Susie in that precise order. Joey is the first to follow because, as I said earlier, he's a people pleaser, and wants to stay on Frank's good side. Julie next because now that Frank and Joey have done it, she can avoid most of the responsibility for doing it because she's just following along. And at the end, Susie's reluctant has to be forced into it by Frank because she's more insecure and lacks the confidence to take a life. But in the cinematic, it's done differently. 
because while Frank does stab the cleaner first, it's Julie who follows up. Instead of depicting Joey and Susie also getting involved, there's this random scene of Julie painting a bloody smile on Frank's mask. And I hate to sound pernickety here, but when it comes to a scene as pivotal as this, the order of the stabbings really does matter. The cinematic just kind of forgets Joey and Susie even exist, and that's really a problem because they're important members of the group and Joey going for both especially is like one of the two appearances he has in the story that actually means anything. This scene has a lot of people justifiably upset at the tone because it's super unclear what this means. Some people thought this was a prior killing and the cleaner kill they took up Mount Ormond came later. But that makes even less sense because that would imply there were two kills that are very similar but slightly different and one had way more emotional impact than the other. It just makes no sense. What's far more likely is that the person who made the cinematic hadn't actually read the Legion's base story beyond a plot summary and forgot that getting details like this right matter for the characterization a cinematic is supposed to do. That being said, the cinematic and the tome are two different things, and the tome doesn't offer any canonical snores that the cinematic does. So if you pretend the cinematic doesn't exist, the tome actually stands very well on its own, as exploration of Julie's character and her relationship with Frank and the others. So what does this mean for Legion's lore as a whole? Well, lots of things. I believe Frank and Julie are decently well characterised, especially Julie who becomes a much more immoral figure in the tome as her relationship with Frank is fully explored. But there's still a lot to be fleshed out. Susie and especially Joey get very little in the way of characterisation and the relationship with the other Legion members are very paper thin at best and non-existent at worst. Maybe Julie's story should have had a passage or two where she talks to one of the others in the group to get a sense of who they are and how they tick. I don't know, but more than any other killer, the Legion has so much untapped story potential that a lot of people have been turned off of due to a cinematic that did more harm than good to understanding their characters. Personally, I don't particularly care for them. They're not bad to me, I just think they're a little overrated, especially given how many truly excellent characters and especially killers DBD has. I think in terms of a multi-person killer with a complex inbuilt relationship, I believe the twins did it better, but that is just me. And it's important to remember that not every character needs to be super complicated. Susie is basically just a one dimensional piece of paper and people love her, although maybe not in the way they should. And characters like these with strong base personalities but lacking in detailed relationships make the perfect material for players and enthusiasts to create their own fanon, fan fiction, or print themselves into their favourite characters. This happens more than anyone else to Susie, but every member has their die hard fans and that's cool as shit and a testament to how fairly simple characters can capture players' imaginations. Maybe that's the lesson to take from this. Maybe Tataru is right. Sometimes a simple character really is all you need, devoid of the baggage of a deep and complex backstory, and just here for a good time. Alright, that's everything I have to say about those troublesome Canadian youngsters. Not those ones. Big thanks once again to Tataru, his insights were invaluable, and there is a link to his Twitch in the description if you're interested in taking a butcher's. Next video will be about the new killer, the abomination known as the Dredge. Make sure you don't miss it, I would recommend subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Maybe like the video if you enjoyed it. And while you're here, check out the links in the description to take a look at my Twitter, my Twitch, my Discord server, and my Ko-fi and Patreon links if you like my content deserves your money. Thank you so much for being here, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I'll see you in the next one. Ta-ta for now.